I want you to be aware that we are running out of space in our kids' wing. It's a good problem to have. So if, you're, if you got a million dollars in the bank, we could use some money to build some more stuff. So I know you're hanging on to it for a rainy day. It's raining right now, so feel free to give it up. I'm just kidding, but seriously. Just, I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> hey, we are uh, in the second part. <laughs> How do you word this? In the second half of the fifth part of a series called Moses. And we spent more time on Pharaoh than on Moses. And that's okay. And so we left midway through the plagues last week, and we kind of just paused it and stopped and said, hey, whatever it takes for you to read the word of God, just read it. I don't care what it takes for you to do it. Please just do it. Read Exodus and begin asking God, God, what are you saying? What can I learn in the midst of this? I shared with you those three in a half things that I felt God was speaking to me in the midst of reading, and I want to remind you of them because as we continue looking at the the plagues, we will remind ourselves of those things. Number one was Pharaoh's heart and how if you, you can't read Exodus without recognizing there's something going on with Pharaoh's heart. It's pretty obvious. It's hardened. And we get a measure in a little bit of exactly what it is, but it's not hard to figure that out, what's going on with him. Um, And he is not refusing to bend. And the question a few weeks ago to you, to me, was what is it that God could ask of you that your answer would be no? Because you all have something. We all have something. And whatever that is, that is a part of our heart that is hardened. And can we begin praying to God, help me to soften that because I am unusable clay. I am resistant to you. The second thing that spoke, spoke to me was Pharaoh's uh, constant trying to compromise or bargain with God. The third thing was, as the plagues take place, who is affected by it? And the first three plagues, the blood and the frogs and the lice slash gnats, everyone's affected. And the fourth plague, the flies, which begin ravaging the land, we have a a measure, an imagery of God standing at the border of Goshen, keeping the flies out, because Goshen is where his people live. And it's the first plague we see where not everybody is affected, only the people of Egypt are affected. We saw how the magicians in the first two plagues repeated the plague, and how in the third plague of the gnats, they couldn't repeat it. And they say, this is the finger of God. And so as I was reading this week, two more things stood out to me. And so I'm going to share one of them with you now, one of them with you at the end. It's who gets it in the story? Who gets it? Well, in the third play, the magicians, for a moment, they get it. They say, this is the finger of God. This is bigger than we are. There's something happened that we can't repeat, we can't understand. There's something going on. And as we continue moving on, we'll see some more people who are affected. And more people who seem to, on some measure, get it. And so we begin reading. Well, quickly, let's remind ourselves of what the plagues have been so far. Number one was the blood. Blood in the Nile, right? Number two was the frogs and how they, they eventually died and they began making the land foul. The third one was the gnats and the lice. The fourth one was the flies. They began eating up the land and the crops. The fifth was the livestock as they began to die. And the fourth and the fifth here were the ones that we, the, the, the plague in no way affects the people of Egypt or if people of Israel within Goshen. The sixth were the boils and how the magicians could not even stand before Moses and Aaron because of their boils on their face and their body. And then we move into the seventh plague. And you got to remember each plague begins to be more of a measure of destruction in the land. Chapter 9, verse 18 of Exodus. Behold, about this time tomorrow, God, this is God speaking, I will send a very heavy hail such as has not been seen in Egypt from the day it was founded until now. Now therefore send, bring your livestock and whatever you have in the field of safety. 
Every man and beast that is found in the field and is not brought home, when the hail comes down on them, will die. This is the first plague that we have an opportunity to avoid it. If you are but obedient. This is the first plague that Egyptians are told, if you do this, you will be spared this plague. Your livestock and your servants will avoid this plague in terms of the destruction it will reap on the individuals. And in verse 20, the one among the servants of Pharaoh who feared the word of the Lord, that's important, who feared the word of the Lord, made his servants and his livestock flee into the houses. But he who paid no regard to the word of the Lord left his servants and his livestock in the field. Genesis 1, all the way through Revelation, this word is significant. Obedience. Obedience. And what we see in Exodus, and what we see after the Exodus, is this word continuing to be a theme. Why? Because people aren't. And as the kings come, the first king, Saul, he does something that is disobedient. And the prophet Samuel comes and he says, didn't you know that God is more interested in your obedience than your sacrifice? Didn't you know, church, that God is interested in your obedience? Where have we been disobedient to God? More times than I care to admit in my life. But here we have an opportunity for an Egyptian, a pagan, a someone who does not believe in God to actually be able to find safety and security from a plague of God if they would but fear God and be obedient. This fear of God isn't a in the corner shaking and being terrified. It's a respect it is an admiration, even an adoration. It's that kind of fear, a respect for what they are capable of. And so those who were obedient, even of the Egyptians, were able to be spared. In verse 25, the hail struck all that was in the field through all the land of Egypt, both man and beast. The hail also struck every plant of the field and shattered every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the sons of Israel were, there was no hail. Who was affected by this plague? Well, first of all, the land of Egypt was affected. But in terms of individually, those who did not heed the word of the Lord were affected. It changes. It's opportunity here, if they would but listen. Verse 27, then Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron, and said to them, I have sinned this time. It sounds really good. Like, Pharaoh finally gets it. I have sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one, and I and my people are the wicked ones. Make supplication, or go and speak on my behalf to the Lord, for there has been enough of God's thunder and hail, and I will let you go, and you shall stay no longer. And Moses' response is, his discernment of what's really going on inside of Pharaoh. Moses said to him, as soon as I go out of the city, I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no hell any longer. But you may know that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you do not yet fear the Lord God. You fear the punishment. You fear the consequences. You don't fear the source. My two-year-old daughter, hopefully, is afraid of being punished. She's two. And so she learns that when this happens, daddy and mommy sometimes spank me. I know, we're bad parents. Sometimes it's in timeout. And she hates timeouts, by the way. And so she learns to behave because she's afraid of the punishment. My 10-year-old daughter, hopefully, has 
learn to obey not out of fear of the punishment, but out of respect for the parent. It changes. If I'm still parenting my 10-year-old like my 2-year-old, what's going to happen? She will rebel. Because eventually the fear of the punishment isn't as much as the desire to disobey. And she'll choose it. Pharaoh fears the punishment. He does not fear the Lord. And so whatever it takes to end the punishment, I'll do it until it's gone. Sound familiar? Verse 31. Now the flax and the barley were ruined. For the barley was in the ear and the flax in the bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not ruined, for they ripen late. Which tells us what? There is yet more to lose. Or from Pharaoh's perspective, we have something else to rely on. There's something left that we can rely on. So if I have something to rely on, why would I want to rely on God? Sound familiar? There's a measure of hope for Pharaoh. What he doesn't realize is what I actually have can still be taken from me. He's confident in what he has. And so Moses goes out, he spreads his hand, and the hail and the thunder cease. In verse 34, but when Pharaoh saw the rain and the hail and thunder had ceased, he sinned again. And he hardened his heart, he and his servants. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not let the sons of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. When he saw relief, he went back to believing and doing what he did before. Why do we do this? God, I'm struggling. God, I'm, I'm just on my knees. I feel broken. I'm destroyed. Help me alleviate this pain, this burden, whatever it is. And when it ends, what do we tend to do? We tend to get back up and go where we were before we were on our knees. When there's relief, much like Pharaoh, I go back to doing that which I was doing before, which is almost always some form of disobedience. I'm much more like Pharaoh than I care to admit. And so verse, verse 1 of chapter 10, we get a measure of, at this point, we've already discussed this at this point. Let's remind you all. After the one of these plagues, Pharaoh just, God just says to Pharaoh, essentially, I'm done. All the plagues will take place. I'm going to finish this work all the way to the end. And so in verse 1 of 10, we read that. The Lord says to Moses, go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them. And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. What does God want here? He wants his name to be known. And from a human point of view, that sounds very arrogant. But if you're God and you are holy and you are perfect, what other name is worthy of being known than his? There is none. God knows the best thing for us is him. And he wants to give himself to us. We just tend to choose something else. Especially when it's more convenient. And so... Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and says to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. Here we have an indicator of what's wrong with Pharaoh's heart. He's arrogant. He's prideful. Again, much like my own. He doesn't really need God, except for when life is hard, they need him to stop doing what he's doing. But then when that happens, he goes back to trusting himself. And when God says, let my people go, that they may serve 
me, Pharaoh's response must be, they're my people and they serve me. They're my slaves. They belong to me. Pharaoh does not um, recognize the authority or the claim that God makes on his people. He instead makes the claim himself. And so when he offers a compromise, on some level, Pharaoh thinks he's trying to be nice and gracious. Verse 4, For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They will also eat the rest of what has escaped. That which you were hoping in, that was, that was left of your food source, it will no longer be there. What is left from you to you from the hail, and they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. When I was about 10 or so years old in Kentucky, we had a plague of locusts. They said every seven years that it happens. I don't, it only happened once that I remember. And these things came down in mass, and they were everywhere. As a kid, it was cool. I played with bugs all day long. And you can grab one, you can shake it like this, and make really cool sounds. But they eat everything. The grass, the trees, your mom's plants. Mom's always mad. And I mean, I can't begin to... They're everywhere. And then they like shed, and there's little pieces of them everywhere. It's disgusting. These are so bad, you can't even see the sky, it says. Verse 7, Pharaoh's servant said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? Who gets it? The servants of Pharaoh get it. Who doesn't get it? Pharaoh doesn't really get it. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones that are going? Okay, Pharaoh already knows the answer to this question. But he asks it anyway. Moses says, We shall go with our young, our old, our sons, our daughters, our flocks, our herds. We shall go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. Then Pharaoh says to them, Thus may the Lord be with you, if ever I let you and your little ones go. Take heed, for evil is in your mind. There's some irony there, the Pharaoh accusing Moses of evil. Not so. Go now, the men among you, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desire. So they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Why? Because Pharaoh still thinks he owns them. And he knows, if you all go, you're not coming back. But if your men just go, they'll come back. He is maintaining a measure of control. It's a half measure. It's a, I'll, I'll give in here, and you, God, have to give in here and God does not compromise. Not very godly for God to compromise. Because he knows what is already true. What he said will happen, he will make happen. And so they were driven out of Pharaoh's presence because he's mad at them because they all want to go. And so Moses does what he says. His hand gets stretched out, the locusts come and begin eating. And then verse 15 of this chapter 9, uh, for they covered, verse chapter 10, sorry, they covered the surface of the whole land. So the land was darkened and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees the hell had left. Thus, nothing green was left on tree or plant in the field through all the land of Egypt. It's all gone. What you were relying on, what you hoped in, has been taken away. And Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron, and he says, this sounds like a repeat because it is, I have sinned against the Lord your God. I'm sorry because this is not fun. This is inconvenient. This is not pleasant. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once. 
and make supplication. Go and speak on my behalf to the Lord your God that he would only remove this death from me. Sound familiar? And so Moses goes and he prays and the wind comes and it pushes the locusts out of the way into the Red Sea and all the locusts are gone. Verse 20, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the sons of Israel go. Regardless of whether or not God is hardening Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh's on his own has never humbled himself. He is still an arrogant man who seems to think himself either a god or backed by his Egyptian gods. He doesn't get it. Now, the next plague begins, and I want to read this verse 21, which you don't have it, but it's okay. And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. Have you ever been in darkness so dark you can feel it? I'm not sure I have. (laughs) I've been in some dark places before. I've been in places that feel dark in terms of hopelessness. And so Moses stretches out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Who's affected? In the land, everybody. But the Israelite people are prepared. They have something to keep the darkness at bay. It's light. The Egyptian people do not. And they are too afraid to even leave their beds for three days for fear of walking out into some place they'll get lost. It's that dark outside. Verse 24, verse 24, then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, go serve the Lord. Okay, this is another bargain. Only let your flocks and your herds be detained or they can stay. Even your little ones may go with you. Like, he's like, I'm going to be a gracious ruler. Your kids can go too, but your animals, they have to stay. Because if your animals stay, you'll probably come back. And Moses gives us an excuse of why that can't be. But the reality is this. No, because God said all of us. And Pharaoh is angry. Verse 27. The, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. and He was not willing to let them go. And Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Beware. Do not see my face again. For in the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, you are right. I shall never see your face again. And there's a promise of the next and the final plague, which is, in my opinion, the most devastating. The death of the firstborn children. And we have in the middle of this promise where then we, you know, Moses makes this threat, this promise of what's to come. And Pharaoh again hardens his heart. Aaron and Moses leave the sight of Pharaoh and they never encounter one another face to face again. And then we have this um, preparation in terms of explaining what to do next. And they're told, essentially, be ready to go at any point in time. When, when, when we say go, be ready to go. And in fact, your, your dough, don't let it rise. Just take it and let's go. And on the night of this plague, you are to stay up in the, into the night, in your chairs, at your table, and eat a feast or eat a meal. And it's a very specific, symbolic meal, which is carried over for the next thousands of years. And if you then slaughter your sheep or your lamb, and you put the lamb, the blood of the lamb, on the mantle or on the doorframe of your home, then when the angel of the Lord comes to kill the firstborn, it will pass over your home. Who is given this idea? Anybody in the land who follows this commandment, who follows this rule, has the opportunity to avoid this death. If you fear the Lord and you do it, then you will be spared. And so there are some Israelite people who don't fear the Lord, who don't obey this, and they go to bed. 
And there are Egyptian people who probably do obey it, and they're spared. And so the, the angel of the Lord comes to the city, comes to the town, comes to the land, and when it finds a house with the blood of the lamb on the doorframe, it passes over. And this becomes the Passover feast that we hear about Jesus going to every single year in remembrance of what God has done and what God does to free his people. And we all, we all would say, I struggle with this too. This is not fair. This is, this is not righteous. It's not justice. But remember, what began this? Pharaoh telling his people to go and kill all the babies of Israel, all the boys. Who started it? Pharaoh. Who ends it? God. Go back 420 years before this story takes place. Why are they even in Egypt? Because a Hebrew, Israelite man was sent there as a slave. He moves up the ranks, becomes a second in command. And God uses him to save Egypt. Egypt is an empire that it was in this day because of the, the power and wealth it gains because of Joseph, the Israelite man, who gave them a plan that God gave him to help them gain wealth and give freedom and safety and food to all those around them. And then he moves his family, the, the people of Hebrew, Hebrew people, into Goshen to be protected from the famine. Egypt was supposed to be a caretaker, a protector of God's people. And instead, they become um, an attacker, a destroyer, and make them into his slaves. Their slaves. That wasn't their purpose. And they stopped serving their purpose. God intervenes. As you read through this and we begin thinking about God, where are you catching my attention? Let me remind you of those places that caught my attention. It's the heart of Pharaoh. And what God was, is telling me oftentimes, and it's a constant reminder because I'm so stubborn, Sam, your heart is too much like Pharaoh. You've hardened it in places that I want to use you. You say yes to the easy things and no to the hard things that I've called you to. And so God's working on my heart. I'm guilty of bargaining with God. Are you? That I'll do this if you meet me here and God's saying, no, I'm calling you here. I'll help you get there. But I'm not going to decrease my requirement, my request of you. I don't want you to be kind of sinless. I want you to be fully sinless. I want you to be kind of like me, be just like me. I love how in, in the story we see who's affected and how as the story continues, people who become obedient are able to avoid the destruction that God is bringing because obedience is just so paramount. And that speaks to me over and over again. Sam, be more obedient. Who gets it? Some days I do. Other days, not so much. How does that speak to you? And the final thing that uh, it really caught my attention this week, honestly, it was, it was really neat, was looking at Moses and his reaction when Pharaoh says to him, go and pray on my behalf to remove the plague. What I would have said if I were Moses was this, no, you need to suffer a little more first. You kind of had this coming, Pharaoh. This is totally your fault, Pharaoh. I'll pray when I get around to it. Instead, Moses immediately goes and he prays to God and has the plague removed. Pharaoh, it isn't a measure of Pharaoh says, if you pray, then I'll do it. It's just please go and pray and have it gone. And Moses goes and he prays and the plague is gone. I don't like praying for my enemies. Do you? Those people who are hard to love, I want to pray for them. Except I'll, I'll pray for this. God, would you punish them, please? Moses doesn't do that. 
Moses simply says, I, I think, he says this, I'm laying it in God's hands. I want no part in deciding who deserves what. You want to relieve Pharaoh? I'll pray for it. And God does it every single time. I want to be more like Moses in this way. Christ himself said what? Well, he said, go and pray for your enemies. He wasn't playing around. He meant it. And so as people who are hard for me to love, what God is telling me this week is, Sam, I want you to pray for them and let me show you how to love them. Whether it's a personality clash, a political clash, a religious clash, love them and pray for them and let God decide what to do with it. That's what God's speaking to me. What is God speaking to you? We close in this song, I, I want to hope and I want to pray and I want to expect us all to be a people who were asking that question. What caught your attention? Maybe it had nothing to do with this text. Where is God speaking to you? How will you and will you respond? God is more interested in obedience than sacrifice. Let's pray. Father, thank you for being truth. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for speaking to us. Even though my heart is so hardened, even though I bargain when I should just say yes, even though I tend to, when I have the relief, go back to my own ways. Help me, Father, to be an obedient servant of you, to pray for my enemies and to find ways to love them. Thank you, Father. Amen. I want to leave you with this thought. Um, we've heard this before from us, probably. When we go to South Dakota, to the reservation there, um, and we do ministry there, we try to do ministry there, we're, we're told before we get there, 100% of these kids are molested, um, harassed, and taken advantage of. 100% of these kids. And when you have the kid there in the mission site, and the parents, the uncles come and pick them up, you know that parent and or that uncle is probably mol molesting this child. And it, it, the missionaries say that. say, Sam... Can you love the villain as you love the victim? Because God does. Can I pray for the, the person who is doing the, the damage in the same way I'm praying for the person who's being damaged? That's a hard place to be. That's what we need to be willing to do. I'm not saying we, we stand there and let it happen. But can we love the villain and the same way we love the victim it's hard I think it's more in line with who God is though